Question one, Mr. Jones, is considering investing in a company. He understands that ordinary shares are the most common type of share capital, but he is unsure about their ranking in the event of company liquidation. According to CISI regulations, how are ordinary shareholders treated in a liquidation scenario? A. Ordinary shareholders are the first to receive their share of the company's assets. B. Ordinary shareholders receive their share after all creditors and preference shareholders are paid in full. C. Ordinary shareholders are not entitled to any repayment in the event of liquidation. D. The ranking of ordinary shareholders depends on the size of their individual investment. Correct answer. B. Ordinary shareholders receive their share after all creditors and preference shareholders are paid in full. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize investor protection and fair treatment of shareholders. The Financial Conduct Authority, FCA Hand, FCA Hand 1, which is a key reference for CISI exams, states that ordinary shareholders rank behind creditors and preference shareholders in a liquidation. This means ordinary shareholders will only receive a payout if there are sufficient assets remaining after all other claims are settled. Question 2. A company is considering issuing a new class of shares called deferred shares. These shares would offer a higher dividend payout than ordinary shares but would have no voting rights. According to CISI regulations, how would deferred shares typically rank in a liquidation scenario compared to ordinary shares? A. Deferred shares would rank equally with ordinary shares. B. Deferred shareholders would be paid in full before ordinary shareholders. C. The ranking of deferred shares depends on the specific terms set by the company. D. Deferred shares would not receive any repayment in the event of liquidation. Correct answer. C. The ranking of deferred shares depends on the specific terms set by the company. Explanation. The terms of deferred shares can vary, but CISI regulations require clear disclosure of these terms to investors. The ranking of deferred shares in a liquidation would be defined in the company's constitution or the terms of issuance. These shares may rank behind ordinary shares, alongside them, or even receive a fixed payout before ordinary shareholders depending on the specific structure designed by the company. Question 3. Ms. Lee is analyzing a company's capital structure and has come across a class of preference shares with a cumulative dividend feature. She is unsure how cumulative dividends differ from regular dividends on preference shares. Which of the following statements about cumulative preference shares is most accurate? A. Cumulative preference shares only receive dividends if the company is profitable in a particular year. B. Cumulative preference shareholders have priority over ordinary shareholders when receiving dividends. C. Cumulative preference shares have voting rights at shareholder meetings. D. Cumulative preference dividends accumulate indefinitely, even if not declared by the company. Correct answer. B. Cumulative preference shareholders have priority over ordinary shareholders when receiving dividends. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize fair treatment of different share classes. Cumulative preference shares come with a specific dividend entitlement. The Companies Act 2006, Companies Act 2006, 1, outlines that any missed or unpaid dividends on cumulative preference shares accumulate and must be paid in full before ordinary shareholders receive any dividends. This protects preference shareholders by ensuring they receive their entitled dividends even if the company experiences a period of low profitability. Question 4. Ms. Garcia is interested in investing in a Chinese company but is concerned about trading directly on the Chinese stock exchange. She comes across a security called an American Depository Receipt Adder. How does an ADR typically function in facilitating investment in a foreign company? Okay. ADR represents a fractional ownership of a single share of the underlying foreign company. B. ADR is a debt security issued by you. S. Bank that represents ownership of shares in a foreign company. C. ADR grants MS. Garcia voting rights at shareholder meetings of the Chinese company. D. ADRS are always denominated in the currency of the foreign company. Correct answer. B. ADR is a debt security issued by you. S. Bank that represents ownership of shares in a foreign company. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize providing clear information to investors on different investment products. 
matters as outlined by the Securities and Exchange Commission SEC Regulations, SEC Rule 144-1, or depository receipts issued by a U.S. bank that represent ownership of shares in a foreign company. These instruments allow investors like MS Garcia to invest in foreign companies without trading directly on the foreign exchange. A DRS can be denominated in USD or another currency, depending on the issuing bank's structure. Question 5. Mr. Hernandez has purchased shares in a global depository reset GDR program for a Brazilian company. He is unsure if he is entitled to receive dividends on the underlying shares. According to CISI regulations, how are dividends on GDRS typically handled? A. Mr. Hernandez will not receive any dividends on DRS. B. The depository bank will retain all dividends received on the underlying shares. C. Mr. Hernandez will receive dividends on DRS, potentially subject to withholding taxes. D. GDR dividends are always paid in the same currency as the underlying foreign share. Correct answer. C. Mr. Hernandez will receive dividends on DRS, potentially subject to withholding taxes. Explanation. GDRS function similarly to a DRS but represent shares of a company in a country other than the United States. CISI regulations on client communication require transparency regarding dividend payments. The depository bank, acting as custodian of the underlying shares, will typically collect dividends on those shares and pass them through to GDR holders, potentially after deducting withholding taxes as per local regulations. The currency of the GDR dividend may differ from the currency of the underlying share depending on the program's structure. Question 6. Ms. Brown is considering investing in a DR program but is concerned about the liquidity of her investment. She wonders if DRS can be easily bought and sold on a secondary market. How are DRS typically traded according to CISI regulations? A. DRS can only be redeemed for the underlying shares directly from the issuing company. B. DRS can be freely traded on a secondary market subject to exchange listing requirements. C. CISI regulations require all DRS to be listed on a recognized stock exchange. D. The liquidity of a DR program depends solely on the liquidity of the underlying foreign company. Correct answer. B. DRS can be freely traded on a secondary market, subject to exchange listing requirements. Explanation. DRS are designed to enhance investor access to foreign companies. CISI regulations emphasize ensuring clients understand the features of their investments DRS, once issued, can be freely bought and sold on a secondary market, such as a stock exchange or an over-the-counter ATRA market, subject to meeting the listing requirements of that exchange. While the liquidity of the underlying foreign share can influence the overall DR market, the ease of buying and selling DRS depends on the specific program's trading venue. Question 7. Mr. Khan is analyzing an investment opportunity and has come across a security called a warrant. He understands warrants allow him to buy a stock at a specific price in the future, but is unsure about the source of the underlying stock. With respect to warrants, how do they differ from typical stock offerings by a company? A. Warrants are directly issued by a company, granting the right to purchase its own shares. B. Warrants are issued by a separate entity, typically an investment bank, and provide the right to purchase shares of another company, the issuer. C. Warrants offer guaranteed dividends if the underlying stock price reaches a certain level. D. Warrants convert automatically into common stock after a predetermined period. Correct answer. B. Warrants are issued by a separate entity, typically an investment bank, and provide the right to purchase shares of another company, the issuer. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the structure of different investment products. Warrants, as distinguished from company stock offerings, are derivative instruments typically issued by an investment bank. These warrants grant the holder the right, but not the obligation, to purchase shares of a specific company, the issuer at a predetermined price, exercise price, by a certain date, expiry date. The issuer of the warrant is a separate entity from the company who shares the warrant allows purchase of. Question 8. Ms. Davis is considering investing in a covered warrant. She has heard that these warrants offer some element of downside protection compared to traditional warrants. 
How do covered warrants typically function to potentially offer some protection to the investor? A covered warrants grant the right to purchase a basket of stocks instead of a single stock. B. Covered warrants have a longer expiry date compared to traditional warrants. C. Covered warrants are issued by a company alongside selling its own shares, with the warrant acting as a sweetener. D. Covered warrants offer a guaranteed minimum return on investment upon expiry. Correct answer. C. Covered warrants are issued by a company alongside selling its own shares, with the warrant acting as a sweetener. Explanation. CISI regulations require advisors to understand the features of complex products. Covered warrants are a type of warrant issued by an investment bank, but with a key difference. The issuing bank typically holds an offsetting position in the underlying stock or a similar instrument. This structure can offer some potential downside protection to the warrant holder compared to a traditional warrant. If the stock price falls, the investment bank may benefit from its holding, offsetting some of the losses on the warrant. However, it's important to remember that covered warrants are still complex instruments and do not guarantee a profit. Question 9. Mr. Lopez is interested in exercising his warrant to purchase shares of a company. He is unsure of the specific process involved. According to CISI regulations, what steps should Mr. Lopez typically take to exercise his warrant? A. Mr. Lopez can simply sell the warrant on the secondary market instead of exercising it. B. CISI regulations require Mr. Lopez to contact the issuing company directly to exercise the warrant. C. Mr. Lopez needs to contact his broker or custodian holding the warrant and provide instructions to exercise. D. The process for exercising. A warrant depends on the specific terms outlined in the warrant document. Correct answer. C. Mr. Lopez needs to contact his broker or custodian holding the warrant and provide instructions to exercise. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize the importance of client instructions and following product terms. The process for exercising a warrant will be outlined in the warrant document itself. However, Mr. Lopez will typically need to contact his broker or custodian holding the warrant and provide clear instructions to exercise it. The broker will then handle the communication and ensure proper delivery of the underlying shares upon exercising the warrant at the predetermined price. Question 10. Ms. Lee is building a diversified portfolio and is considering investing in fixed income securities. She has come across corporate bonds and government bonds but is unsure about the key differences in terms of credit risk. How do corporate bonds typically differ from government bonds regarding credit risk? A. Government bonds generally carry higher credit risk than corporate bonds due to government exposure to economic downturns. B. Corporate bonds offer a higher potential return to compensate for the increased credit risk compared to government bonds. C. The credit risk of both corporate and government bonds is identical. D. Investors cannot diversify away credit risk by investing in a portfolio of both corporate and government bonds. Correct answer. B. Corporate bonds offer a higher potential return to compensate for the increased credit risk compared to government bonds. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding investment risks. Credit risk refers to the possibility of an issuer defaulting on its obligations. Government bonds, typically issued by national governments, are generally considered to have a lower credit risk compared to corporate bonds issued by companies. This lower risk is reflected in the typically lower interest rates offered on government bonds compared to corporate bonds. Investors seeking higher potential returns may be willing to accept the increased credit risk associated with corporate bonds. Question 11. Mr. Garcia is analyzing a fixed income security called a floating rate, no, FRN. He understands that FRN now offer periodic interest payments, but is unsure how the interest rate is determined. How are interest payments typically calculated on a floating rate, no? A. FRN interest payments are fixed for the entire term of the bond. B. FRN interest payments are based on a predefined benchmark rate, such as LIBOR, plus a margin. C. FRN interest payments are determined by the issuer at their discretion. D. FRN interest payments are directly linked to the performance of a specific stock or index. Correct answer. B. FRN interest payments are based on a predefined benchmark rate, such as LIBOR, plus a margin. 
Explanation. CISI regulations require advisors to understand the features of different fixed income instruments. Floating rate note. FRNS are a type of bond where the interest rate is not fixed but adjusts periodically based on a predetermined benchmark interest rate, such as the London Interbank Offered Rate, LIBOR. The issuer will typically add a margin to this benchmark rate to determine the final interest payment on the FRN. This feature helps to protect investors from rising interest rates as the coupon payment will adjust accordingly. Question 12. Ms. Hernandez is interested in a pooled investment vehicle that offers tax advantages and professional management. She comes across information on mutual funds and tax transparent funds. How do tax transparent funds typically differ from mutual funds in terms of tax treatment for investors? A. Tax transparent funds are not subject to corporate income tax on their investment gains, while mutual funds are. B. Mutual funds distribute capital gains to investors, who are then taxed on those gains, whereas tax transparent funds do not. C. Both mutual funds and tax transparent funds offer the same tax treatment for investors. D. Investors in tax transparent funds are taxed on the fund's income regardless of whether it is distributed. Correct answer. A. Tax transparent funds are not subject to corporate income tax on their investment gains, while mutual funds are. Explanation. CISI regulations require advisors to understand the tax implications of different investment products for clients. Tax transparent funds, such as real estate investment trusts rates, are structured to pass through their investment income and gains directly to shareholders. These shareholders then report this income on their personal tax returns, potentially benefiting from tax deferred treatment depending on the specific structure and tax laws of the jurisdiction. In contrast, mutual funds are subject to corporate income tax on their investment gains, which can reduce the overall return for investors. Question 13. Mr. Garcia is a high net worth investor seeking access to a wider range of investment opportunities, potentially including unlisted companies. He is considering hedge funds and private equity. Which of the following best describes a key difference between hedge funds and private equity in terms of investment strategy? A. Hedge funds typically invest in a diversified portfolio of assets, while private equity focuses on a smaller number of holdings. B. Hedge funds primarily invest in publicly traded securities, whereas private equity focuses on unlisted companies. C. Private equity funds offer higher liquidity for investors compared to hedge funds. D. There is no significant difference in investment strategy between hedge funds and private equity. Correct answer. A. Hedge funds typically invest in a diversified portfolio of assets, while private equity focuses on a smaller number of holdings. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the risk return profiles of different investment products. Hedge funds employ a wider range of investment strategies, including long-term positions, activist investing, and leverage, which can potentially lead to higher returns but also greater risk. They may invest in a variety of assets, including publicly traded stocks, bonds, and derivatives. Private equity, on the other hand, focuses on investing in unlisted companies or companies undergoing restructuring. These investments are typically illiquid and have a longer lockup period compared to hedge funds. Question 14. Ms. Brown is working on a client order and needs to identify the specific security but is unsure of the difference between ISIN and CUSIP. How do International Securities Identification Number, ISIN, and Committee on Uniform Securities Identification Procedures, QZIP, codes differ in terms of their scope? A. ISIN is a global standard used for all securities, whereas CUSIP is specific to North American securities. B. CUSIP codes are more detailed than ISINS and include information about the issuer. C. ISINS are only used for exchange-traded securities, while CUSIP applies to all types of securities. D. There is no practical difference between ISIN and CUSIP for identifying securities. Correct answer. A. ISIN is a global standard used for all securities, whereas CUSIP is specific to North American securities. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding security identification systems. ISIN, International Securities Identification Number, is a globally recognized 12-character alphanumeric code assigned to unique securities. 
CUSIP, Committee on Uniform Securities Identification Procedures, is a North American standard nine-character alphanumeric code used to identify securities. While both codes serve the purpose of uniquely identifying securities, ISIN offers a wider global scope compared to the regionally specific CUSIP. Question 15. Mr. Garcia needs to locate a specific stock on a trading platform but is only familiar with the company name. He has come across the term ticker symbol but is unsure of its purpose. How do ticker symbols typically function in identifying securities? A. Ticker symbols are unique identifiers assigned to all securities regardless of the exchange. B. Ticker symbols offer a brief, memorable way to identify securities traded on a specific exchange. C. Ticker symbols are only used for exchange-traded funds, ETFs, and not for individual stocks. D. Investors should rely on company names for security identification, and ticker symbols are not reliable. Correct answer. B. Ticker symbols offer a brief, memorable way to identify securities traded on a specific exchange. Explanation. CISI regulations require familiarity with common methods for security identification. Ticker symbols are short, often numeric codes assigned to securities listed on a particular stock exchange. These symbols provide a quick and easy way to identify and track securities on a trading platform. However, it's important to note that ticker symbols can be non-unique across different exchanges, so relying solely on ticker symbols for security identification can be risky. Question 16. Ms. Jones receives a trade confirmation for a security listed on the London Stock Exchange, LSE, but is unfamiliar with the alphabetic code used alongside the security name. She wonders if this code might be a SE, DOL. What is the primary function of the Stock Exchange Daily Official List? Set all. Code. A. SE. DOL codes are internal identifiers used by individual brokers and not a standardized system. B. SE. DOL codes provide a unique identifier for all securities globally. C. SE. DOL codes are the primary security identification method used on the London Stock Exchange. D. SE. DOL codes offer additional information about the security, such as the issuer or currency. Correct answer. C. SE. DOL codes are the primary security identification method used on the London Stock Exchange. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize knowledge of identification systems used in different markets. The Stock Exchange Daily Official List set all code is a seven-character alphanumeric code used to uniquely identify securities on the London Stock Exchange and other UK financial markets. While not a global standard like ISIN, SE, DOL plays a vital role in security identification within the UK financial system. Question 17. Ms. Lee is working on an equity issuance for a new company. She is considering different methods for offering the shares to potential investors. Which of the following methods typically involves selling the securities directly to a small group of institutional investors without a public offering? A. Placing B. Offer for subscription C. Offer for sale. D. Introduction. Correct answer. A. Placing explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding different methods for issuing securities. Placing involves selling securities directly to a limited number of institutional investors, often through investment banks acting as placement agents. This method avoids the complexities of a public offering and allows for a quicker issuance process. Question 18. Ms. Jones is involved in an equity issuance where potential investors are invited to subscribe for new shares at a fixed price. She comes across the terms will offer for subscription and will offer for sale. How do offers for subscription typically differ from offers for sale in terms of price discovery? A. Offers for sale involve a fixed price set by the issuer while offers for subscription allow for price negotiation with investors. B. Offers for subscription typically involve a fixed price set by the issuer, while offers for sale determine the price based on investor demand. C. There is no difference in price discovery between offers for subscription and offers for sale. D. Offers for subscription are used for secondary offerings of existing shares, while offers for sale are used for new issuances. 
Correct answer. B, offers for subscription typically involve a fixed price set by the issuer, while offers for sale determine the price based on investor demand. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the mechanics of equity issuance. Offers for subscription involve a fixed price set by the issuer, and investors apply to purchase shares at that price. Offers for sale, on the other hand, may involve a book-building process where the final offer price is determined based on investor demand and bids received. This can lead to price discovery based on market interest. Question 19. Ms. Brown is analyzing the issuance process for government bonds. She has encountered the terms auction and tap issue but is unsure about the key differences. How does a bond issuance via auction typically differ from a tap issue? A. Auctions involve selling a predetermined amount of bonds at a fixed interest rate, while tap issues allow for flexibility in both amount and rate. B. Auctions are only used for short-term government debt, whereas TAP issues are for long-term bonds. C. TAP issues are open to all investors, while auctions are restricted to institutional investors. D. There is no significant difference between auctions and TAP issues in terms of issuance process. Correct answer. A. Auctions involve selling a predetermined amount of bonds at a fixed interest rate, while TAP issues allow for flexibility in both amount and rate. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding different methods for government bond issuance. Auctions are a public process where investors compete for a predetermined amount of bonds by submitting bids specifying the price, which translates to the yield. They are willing to pay. The bonds are awarded to the investors offering the highest prices. TAP issues, on the other hand, involve the government selling bonds on an ongoing basis directly to interested investors often through appointed dealers. This method allows for more flexibility in terms of the amount and interest rate offered on the bonds. Question 20. Mr. Garcia is working on the settlement of a newly issued government bond. He comes across the term tranche but is unsure of its meaning in this context. What does the term tranche typically refer to in a government bond issuance? A. A tranche refers to the total amount of money raised through the bond issuance. B. A tranche represents a portion of the total bond offering with specific characteristics such as maturity date or interest rate. C. Tranches are used to differentiate between bonds issued by different government agencies. D. A tranche specifies the currency in which the bond is denominated. Correct answer. B. A tranche represents a portion of the total bond offering with specific characteristics such as maturity date or interest rate. Explanation. CISI regulations require knowledge of the terminology used in bond issuance. A tranche refers to a portion of the total bond offering that may have different characteristics such as maturity date or interest rate. Governments may issue bonds in multiple tranches to cater to the diverse investment needs of different investor groups. Question 21. Ms. Jones is reading a news article about a government planning to issue a new bond to raise funds for infrastructure projects. The article mentions the concept of a syndicate but doesn't elaborate on its role. What is the typical role of a syndicate in a government bond issuance? A. Syndicates are independent financial advisors who advise the government on the best issuance method. B. The syndicate refers to the government department responsible for managing the bond issuance. C. A syndicate is a single investment bank appointed to manage the entire bond issuance process. D. A syndicate is a group of investors who come together to purchase a large portion of the bond offering. Correct answer. D. A syndicate is a group of investors who come together to purchase a large portion of the bond offering. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the roles of different participants in the financial markets. A syndicate, in the context of government bond issuance, is a group of investment banks or financial institutions that collaborate to underwrite the bond offering. The syndicate acts as an intermediary between the government and investors, guaranteeing to purchase the unsold portion of the bond offering in exchange for a fee. This helps to ensure the successful issuance of the bond. Question 22. Ms. Lee is a new trader and is concerned about potential conflicts of interest that may arise during the trading process. According to CISI regulations, which of the following actions would be most likely considered? A conflict of interest for a trader. A. Executing a client order promptly and efficiently. 
be recommending a security to a client that the trader also holds personally. C. Negotiating the best possible price for a client's order. D. Disclosing all relevant information about a security to a client before they invest. Correct answer. B. Recommending a security to a client that the trader also holds personally. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize the importance of fair dealing and avoiding conflicts of interest. A conflict of interest arises when a trader's personal interest could influence their professional judgment when executing client orders. In this scenario, recommending a security that the trader also holds personally creates a potential conflict. The trader may be incentivized to recommend the security regardless of its suitability for the client, potentially harming the client's financial interests. Question 23. Mr. Garcia is a broker working on a client order for a large block of shares. He is aware of the potential market impact of such a large trade. Which of the following actions would be most appropriate for Mr. Garcia to take to manage the market impact of the trade? A. Splitting the client order into smaller trades and executing them over time. B. Offering the entire block of shares to a single institutional investor. C. Executing the entire order at the current market price regardless of impact. D. Disclosing the client order details to other market participants. Correct answer. A. Splitting the client order into smaller trades and executing them over time. Explanation. CISI regulations require brokers to act in the best interests of their clients, which includes minimizing the negative impact of their trades on the market price. Splitting the client order into smaller trades and executing them over time allows for a more gradual absorption of the shares by the market, potentially reducing the impact on the price. Question 24. Ms. Jones is reviewing a client order and notices that the order appears to be unusually large or risky for the client's investment profile. What should Ms. Jones do according to CISI suitability requirements? A. Execute the order as instructed by the client without question. B. Explain the risks involved and ensure the client understands the suitability of the investment. C. Refuse to execute the order if it is deemed unsuitable for the client. D. Recommend alternative investment options to the client. Correct answer. B. Explain the risks involved and ensure the client understands the suitability of the investment. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize the importance of client suitability. Brokers have a duty to ensure that investment recommendations and order executions are suitable for the client's risk tolerance, investment objectives, and financial situation. In this scenario, MS Jones should explain the risks involved in a large or risky order and ensure the client understands the implications before executing the trade. She may also recommend alternative investment options that better align with the client's profile. Question 25. Ms. Brown is tasked with choosing a trading venue for a client looking to invest in a specific stock. She is considering a regulated market and an MTF. Which of the following characteristics is typically only applicable to regulated markets? A. Order book transparency. Displaying buy and sell orders on the exchange. B. Pre-trade and post-trade trade transparency. Disclosing details of executed trades. C. Multilateral trading environment where multiple parties can interact. D. Oversight and regulation by a financial authority. Correct answer. B. Pre-trade and post-trade trade transparency. Disclosing details of executed trades. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the differences between trading venues, Pre-trade and post-trade trade transparency, meaning the disclosure of details about orders placed and trades executed, is a key characteristic of regulated markets. This transparency allows investors to assess the level of interest in a security and the overall market depth. MTFS, while also facilitating multilateral trading, may not offer the same level of pre-trade transparency as regulated markets. Question 26. Mr. Garcia is analyzing a new trading platform and is unsure whether it is classified as an MTF or an OTF. The platform allows for trading in corporate bonds but does not offer equities. Which of the following characteristics would be most helpful in determining the classification of the platform? MTF or OTF? A. Whether the platform operates an order book whereby and sell orders in Iraq. 
B, the nationality of the regulator overseeing the platform's operations. C, the types of financial instruments traded on the platform equities versus fixed income. D, the presence of a physical trading floor for order execution. Correct answer. C, the types of financial instruments traded on the platform equities versus fixed income. Explanation. CISI regulations require knowledge of the distinctions between MTFS and OFFS. The types of financial instruments traded on the platform are a key factor in its classification. MTFS are typically restricted to trading in shares and certain other specified instruments with high liquidity, while OTFS can facilitate trading in a wider range of instruments, including fixed income securities like corporate bonds. Question 27, Ms. Jones, is concerned about the level of discretion exercised by trading venues when executing client orders. She is researching the differences between regulated markets and MTFS. How does order execution on a regulated market typically differ from an MTF in terms of discretion? A. Regulated markets allow brokers more discretion in order execution compared to MTFS. B. MTFS offer greater flexibility for order execution based on broker discretion. C. There is no significant difference in the level of discretion used for order execution on MTFS and regulated markets. D. Order execution on a regulated market follows predetermined rules and removes broker discretion. Correct answer. D. Order execution on a regulated market follows predetermined rules and removes broker discretion. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the order execution process on different trading venues. Regulated markets operate under strict rules that govern order matching and execution. Brokers have limited discretion in this process, ensuring fair and transparent order execution. MTFS, on the other hand, may allow for more flexibility in order execution, with some platforms offering operators some discretion in matching or rejecting orders. Question 28. Mr. Garcia is working on an order for a large block of shares. He is considering executing the trade on an exchange or via an MTF. What is a key difference between on exchange trading and trading on an MTF that would be relevant to Mr. Garcia's situation? Hey, on exchange trades benefit from greater pre-trade transparency compared to MTFS. B. MTFS offer. A wider range of order types compared to on exchange trading. C. On exchange trades typically involve lower transaction costs than MTFS. D. MTFS are subject to stricter regulations than exchanges. Correct answer. A. On exchange trades benefit from greater pre trade transparency compared to MTFS. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding the characteristics of different trading venues. Pre trade transparency is a key difference. On exchange trading offers order book transparency, whereby and sell orders are displayed publicly. This allows Mr. Garcia to assess the market depth and potential impact of his large block order on the price. MTFS, while facilitating multilateral trading, may not offer the same level of pre trade transparency, making it more challenging to gauge market interest for a large order. Question 29. Ms. Jones needs to choose a venue to trade a derivative contract not listed on a regulated exchange. She is considering an MTF or an OTC market. Which of the following statements best describes the typical trading characteristics of an OTC market compared to an MTF? The OTC markets offer greater standardization of contracts compared to MTFS. B. MTFS are rate under stricter regulatory oversight than OTC markets. C. OTC markets typically involve bilateral negotiation between counterparties, unlike MTFS. D. Trading on MTFS benefits from greater pre-trade transparency compared to OTC markets. Correct answer. B. OTC markets for unlisted shares typically operate under a less strict regulatory environment than MTFS. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize knowledge of the regulatory landscape for different trading activities. OTC markets for unlisted shares are generally subject to less strict regulation compared to MTF. MTFS, while offering some flexibility compared to exchanges, still operate under a regulatory framework that ensures fair and orderly trading.
OTC markets, on the other hand, may involve less standardization and oversight, increasing the importance of careful due diligence for investors. Question 30 Ms. Brown is analyzing a client order for a complex trade involving multiple securities. She has come across the term program trade. What is a key characteristic of program trading that distinguishes it from a typical individual investor order? A program trades involve a single security and aim to achieve a specific price target. B. Program trades are typically executed algorithmically, relying on predefined instructions. C. Program trades are large, complex orders designed to achieve a specific investment objective. D. Program trades are prohibited by regulations due to their market impact potential. Correct answer. C. Program trades are large complex orders designed to achieve a specific investment objective. Explanation. CISI regulations emphasize understanding different order types. Program trades are large, complex orders involving the simultaneous buying and selling of multiple securities. These trades are designed to achieve a specific investment objective, such as portfolio rebalancing or hedging a position. The complexity and size of program trades often necessitate algorithmic execution to ensure efficient and controlled order handling.